us feels that love, but we also feel God's love more than anything else in his presence and his power here. Amen? Amen. The title of my message today is Blinded by Blame. Try saying that ten times as fast as you can, right? Blinded by blame. Would you turn your Bibles with me if you have them? Would you turn them to John chapter 9, verse 1? I'm reading out of the NIV. You can use any any version that you'd like. My wife is going to put uh, a version up there for you. John chapter 9, verse 1. Out of the NIV. Yes, ma'am. John chapter 9, verse 1. It's okay. Two, three. She couldn't read my handwriting on my text. No, I'm just kidding. John chapter 9, verse 1 through 3. And it says this. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Let's pray. Abba, Father, gracious and merciful God, Holy Spirit, we come to you and we ask you that you would take over this service, that you would just use me as your voice piece, your instrument, your tool, your weapon against the enemy, your weapon against the gates of hell, to advance your kingdom and to usher people out of hell and into the kingdom of heaven. I pray that in the name of Jesus. I pray that today that this word would be so divine and so impacting and so life changing that people would make commitments to follow and seek after you, that you would bind and that you would rebuke every devil in hell, that you would set every captive free, that you would help people to make decisions to follow after you for the rest of their lives. I pray that in the name of Jesus, that you would let them know that you are still here for them and that you still love them, regardless of what has happened in their life, regardless of what they've done, regardless of what they're doing and regardless of what they're gonna do, you still created them to have an appointment with you. And this morning, I pray that you would break every chain that you would break every shackle, that there would be true freedom in the house of God this morning. I pray that in Jesus' precious and holy name, bind and rebuke every devil and send them back to the pit of hell they came from. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, please be seated in the presence of the Lord. Amen, amen. Feel free to, to participate if you'd like. If you, if you feel the, holy, the nudging of the Holy Spirit, you're welcome to shout out amen or Hallelujah, clap your hands, all right? I won't, I won't shush you. Amen? Amen? Now, if you come up here and try to preach with me, then I might have to ask you to have a seat. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so the disciples asked Jesus a question. A few weeks ago when I was preaching, I, I, I alluded to this message. And it seems like the moment that I did that, it's like God started something inside of me about today. So I've been waiting about three weeks or so to share this word with you. Because we have a tendency sometimes to be blinded by blame. So the disciples, they're trying to figure something out. And they ask Jesus, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And that's the question that I want to address this morning. That's the question that I want to tackle this morning. Who sinned, Rabbi, that this man be born blind, him or his parents? You see, people need to stop looking for who to blame in their lives. I have friends and I have family members that if you ever listen to their story, they always have to villainize somebody. They always have to have a bad guy in their story. The bad guy could be at work. The bad guy could be in school. The bad guy could be laying next to them in the bed every night. And in my mind, I think they weren't that bad for you to marry them. Right? At one point, you thought they were all good. Amen? Is that my phone or is that somebody else's? But it's all right, it's all right. Answer it and tell them to get to church. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> tell them we're waiting on them. <laughs> Let me say it like this, church. Many times we spend too much time trying to find somebody who to blame that will never receive the healing that we could have if we would stop focusing so much on who whose fault it is and who we're trying to blame and who can we blame to who can we blame for what we're going through. Many times we, we stop and we hinder our healing. Many times we stop and we hinder our breakthrough. Many times we stop and we hinder 
getting over it. And sometimes in life, there's some things that you just have to move past and you have to get over. Have you ever met somebody that whenever you're talking to them, they always bring up what happened to them 20 years ago? And you're like, dude, you told me this last week. Right? At first you try to be polite, you try to listen to it again, and then, and then you start giving subtle hints like, oh yeah, I remember, yeah, I remember you told me that. Right? And then, and then after a while you're like, no, 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 you already told me that. You told me that every time I see you. And then they're mad at you. Right? We've got to be careful and we need to stop looking for people to, to blame. And sometimes, like I said, we just need to get over it. I shared with you a couple of weeks ago that, that over the course of, I'd say right before Thanksgiving, I might be off on the timeline a little bit, but about 16 of my family members contracted COVID. And I found out through them that other family members, their parents, their siblings, cousins, were on a group and they were trying to find out who, who brought the COVID into the circle, right? And that's what they were thinking, like, I wanna know whose fault it is. Does it really matter whose fault it is? Is it gonna make the person heal faster if you know who, who did it? Because the truth of it is, is this, if you haven't figured this out yet, none of us are immune, right? Some people thought, think that they're immune. None of us are immune. And you can get it from touching the wrong, like Pacho said earlier this week, you can get it from touching the wrong tomato at H-E-B. You touch what somebody else touched, rub your nose, and there you go. It's that easy. Right? All we can do is pray and pray that we get past it and that we get through it. It doesn't really matter whose fault it is. It's not going to heal the person any faster. Really and truly, all we need is for those family members and friends to be healed and to get over that thing and to get past it. We don't need to know who did it. But some people are always trying to spend their time trying to find somebody to blame. All you have to do is look at politics from even before November, even up until now. And all, what you will see is you will see both parties trying to shift blame like crazy. Both parties are trying to blame each other. The truth is that you need to start looking for a solution more than you need to start finding somebody to blame. Amen. You need to start looking for a solution and not looking for somebody to blame. And that's exactly what Jesus' disciples did when they asked the question, who sinned, Rabbi? This man or his parents said he was born blind. What difference did it make? It didn't change his condition. It didn't change his situation. The man was still blind. The Bible says that he was born blind. This man was born blind. And these Jews wanted to find out whose fault it was that he was born blind. You see, it seems like blaming other people, it's become the norm. It's become the common practice of, all, of our culture today. It happens in politics. It happens in churches. It happens in relationships. It happens in sports. It happens everywhere. We're always looking for someone to blame. Somebody's involved in a crash, and the first thing you want to know is it, it's their fault, right? It's their fault. And that's what we do, right? And all of a sudden, you start justifying your behavior. You start justifying why you did what you did instead of figuring out if people are okay or if they need any help. There are some people in here right now or they're watching online or wherever they may be who are saying that it's someone else's fault that things turned out the way that they did and they're stuck there. You know, I have a, I have a friend of mine who was raised, I've known him since we were children, where their parent always blamed everybody else. Oh, it's... It's not Mimo's fault that, that his dad left. Pobrecito, he's always been that way. Pobrecito, he's never gotten a break in life. Oh, pobrecito. After a while, I'm not being ugly, but what happens is that is ingrained into the child. And so when they become an adult and they become a man or a woman, they start saying, well, I never had a good, a real chance like everybody else. Oh, poor me. And it becomes a crutch and it becomes an excuse to not do what you should be doing. And then you start making excuses on, well, I would have done it if I was born on the north side. <laughs> I would have done it, right? And that's what we do. And no, that's not the case. You can live life just like anybody else. The Bible says that God is a respecter of no man. And there are some people who have been through some horrible atrocities, and there have been some people who've gone through some horrible things in their lives, but yet they still rise up above those occasions. 
And they start saying, you know what, I'm not going to do this. They stop looking for people to blame and they start getting their life together. They start moving forward. There comes a time where you have to start moving forward in your life. You can't sit there being stuck on whose fault it is that you're in the situation that you're in. It's someone else's fault that the kids are having trouble in school. It's the teacher's fault. Right? You know that when I used to get in trouble in school, I would get a whooping at school and a whooping at home. Even if it wasn't my fault. As a matter of fact, there are many times, probably the majority of times, that I got a whooping for hanging around with the wrong crowd. Why? Because I should have known better than to be there. You see, we've lost that in our culture. It's someone else's fault that they weren't the spouse that they should have been because they were angry and they were bitter and they were hurt and you did this to me so now I'm going to make you pay. And so all they do is they sit there and they blame you and they sit there and they blame other people for why why their life is the way that it is. It's somebody else's fault because they didn't do their part. It's somebody else's fault because you made me this way. And in reality, you have a choice. We can choose to stop being a certain way and we can change the way that, the, that we are. The Bible says to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You see, God took away your excuse when he gave you that scripture and said, it don't matter whether you were born like that, well then be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You see how it works? He's telling you, you don't have to stay in that world and you don't have to stay in that pit. You can rise up above it because you're my child. Amen. There are some people who could be so happy right now, but they're stuck on blaming everyone else instead of just moving on with their lives. And they're using blame as an excuse to justify why they are the way that they are. They're blaming pe other people because they're miserable. They're blaming other people because of their finances. They're blaming people because their marriage didn't work out. They're blaming people because they didn't finish college or they didn't finish school. They're blaming people because they had to hold, They can't hold on to a job. And they're stuck blaming everyone else for their problems instead of trying to find some real solutions. Wouldn't it be awesome if we could all just work together to solve some problems that we're facing right now instead of fighting over whose fault it is? Wouldn't it be better to find a cure instead of sitting there and trying to make everything so political? Right now in the climate that we live in, wouldn't it be better if we could just come together and work together and get on the same sheet of music, on the same page, and work as a team to really start working together? But we can't because we're blinded by blame. We want to sit there and stand up for our, our political party more than who we believe in. I believe in Jesus, and I believe that he can do anything. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that with man, things are impossible, but with God, nothing is impossible. You see, stop looking at who the president is or who the governor is and start looking at who your Messiah is. Start looking at who your Savior is. Start looking at who your Redeemer and your Deliverer is. Start looking at who your Healer is. How dare you give someone else that much power and control over your life? It's their fault that you're not happy. I'm sorry, but nobody should be big enough to take the joy and the happiness that God has placed in my heart. Nobody should be big enough or bad enough in your life to stop you from fulfilling God's plan for your life. As a matter of fact, let me change that. There ain't nobody big enough that can stop God from fulfilling his plan for my life. And there ain't nobody big enough that can stop God from fulfilling his plan for your life. God has given you and I the gift of intelligence and intellect and understanding. God has given you and I the gift of comprehension. He's given us that gift that he's, he hasn't given any other species on the planet. You and I are, are supposed to be smarter than all the other animals in the kingdom. God has given you the ability and the gift of thought and ideas to be able to rationalize and to be able to understand. God has given you the capability to ask why. And asking why is important because when you ask why, you get understanding. Listen to what I'm telling you. I've heard many church people tell you, oh, we're not supposed to ask why. Show me in the Bible where it says that. What you're not supposed to do is you're not supposed to doubt God. You're supposed to trust him, but it's okay to ask why. It's okay to ask why so that I can understand. And many times you might not understand until you're on the other side of it. And then you'll be like, that's why I went through what I went through. 
When you're sitting there and you're holding another person who's broken in your arms and they're crying and you're praying for them and you realize, Lord, you allow me to go through it so that I can relate to this person. Lord, just like when you heal them, just like when you deliver them, I mean, just like when you heal me, just like when you deliver me, heal them, Lord. Deliver them and set them free. You did it for me, you can do it for them. That's what I've learned about my God is that he can do anything. Now, don't get me wrong. There are some horrible things that just happened. There are some calamities, there's some disasters, there's some hurricanes, tornadoes that they just happen indiscriminately. It don't matter what side of town you live on. Sometimes they just happen. It don't matter what, what school you went to. Sometimes atrocities just happen. And those things will happen no matter how holy you are and no matter how wicked you are. The book of Ecclesiastes says in the Bible, it says that sometimes life just happens. Period. Many people will say, Lord, what did I do to deserve this? You didn't do anything. Life is just happening. But where is your trust? Who are you trusting? Are you, you know what? Sometimes I'll be like, Lord, I, I don't know why I'm going through this, but I trust you. Let me make it clear today. I trust you. Right? Whether I live or die, whether I sink or swim, I trust you. Sometimes things don't make sense in your life, and that's okay. It doesn't always have to make sense. And the disciples here in this, in this text, they were trying to make sense of why the blind man was the way that he was. So they look at the man and they, they, they realize that he's born blind and they ask Jesus, who sinned? Was it this man or was it his parents? They were trying to make sense out of what they were seeing with their physical eye. But the Bible says to walk by faith and not by sight. See, it doesn't matter how things look. My question to you this morning is where, where is your faith? Because I've had a many uh, acclaiming a mighty Christian, those that claim that they're mighty Christians say, Lord, why are you doing this to me? And I think sometimes like, who said it was God that was doing to you, doing it to you? Yeah. Right? Or God, why did you let the devil do this to me? If you read this text, right? This man was born blind. What did Jesus say? So that the father could be glorified is what some versions say. This one says so that his so that God's work could be displayed in this man's life. In other words, God allowed him to be born blind so that at this appointed time, God could show up and show off his awesome power, his awesome glory, and his awesome might. Who's to say that whatever it is that you're going through this morning isn't so that way God can show up and show off his awesome power, his awesome glory, and his awesome might in your life? Oh my God, I'm on to the God on this thing. But I think that everyone does that to a certain degree. Every one of us. We think things like, how did this person end up like this? What did they do to end up like this? Did they make the wrong choices? Because sometimes that is what happens. Or you might think they wouldn't be like that if they were raised right. I've heard that too. Well, let me tell you, I've seen a bunch of good parents raise some bad children. And it wasn't because of the way that they raised their children. It was just that the kid was bad. Amen? Amen. Some of you are like, not my baby. Don't, don't write it. <laughs> I've seen it. And yes, I've seen some people make bad choices as well. Maybe you thought to yourself that you wouldn't be the way that you are if you were just treated right. I've heard that too. Well, Pastor, I wouldn't be this way if, I, if they just treated me right. Well, you still have a choice to, to not be that way. You know, there's a, there's a class that I teach for the sheriff's office, and in there it talks about, it's, it's called Reasonable Alternatives, is the name of the class that we have on it. And there's a quote by a chief somewhere, I forget where now, it evades me. But he says, we act like ladies and gentlemen, not because of the people that we encounter, but because that's who we are. You see, who you are should not change how you treat people. Amen? But what we'll do is, oh, you want to talk to, who do you think you're talking to? You want to talk to me like that? Oh, you're going to pay, right? That's what we do. But instead of showing people the love of Christ, what we do is we want to make people pay. And I believe this, that at one time or another, at some point in everybody's life, you may have asked yourself the question, how did I end up here? How did we get where we're at now? And then we started to find, try to figure out who to blame for where we're at and where we ended up and how we did it's their fault we divorced. It's their fault. 
that I ended up like this. It's your fault. And that's what we do. We have to do it. You know, now that my kids are getting older, I get to hear them try to blame me for everything. My two older kids. Not you, Jeremiah. My two older kids. But you know what I find funny is that I think they have it, they have it way easier than we had it. Amen. Amen? Amen? But I realize that, you know what, every teenager goes through that. They'll figure it out. They'll figure it out. So again, you can say whatever you want. I'm still daddy, right? And I still trust God. And so I trust that God is going to bring them in to where he created them to be. But it's funny because I, I, I laugh sometimes. I find it interesting that whenever I read this text, the blind man didn't even ask to be healed. You ever notice that? I'm about to blow some people's doctrine out of the water. Not because I'm trying to do that, but because of what the word of God says. This man didn't even ask to be healed. He wasn't even saved. Now, there are other people that were blind in the Bible who the Bible records that they cried out to Jesus. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, son of David. And they said that when the crowd tried to hush them, that they cried out, oh, Lord Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. But not this man. This man was in the room while these disciples were asking Jesus, why is this dude blind? Who sinned? Was it him or his parents? Is what the Bible says. I think it's crazy how people will look at your life and they'll try to analyze and they'll try to rationalize and they'll try to understand what happened to you. They'll try to figure out how you ended up the way that you did. It's funny because everybody is an expert about everybody else's life except for their own. They'll tell you, you want to know how to do it? Let me tell you how to do it. And then, and then they'll try to tell you. They'll try to tell you who to marry. They'll try to tell you who you should be with and who you should leave. They'll try to tell you how you should do it. I get a big kick out of people who have nothing to do with God. They have nothing to do with church. They have nothing to do with ministry. And yet they'll come and they'll try to tell us how to run the church. You can't even pay your bills. You're about to get kicked out of your house. And you want to tell us how to run the church. I'm like, come on. You can't even manage your check, but you want to tell everybody else how they're supposed to live their life. Come on. You can't even tell time. And you want to tell me how to, how to live my life. It's crazy to me. Jesus showed these people that they were focused on the wrong thing. And truth be told, only God knows how you ended up the way that you did according to this text and why you ended up that way. And you know what I'm realizing is that there are a lot of people who are missing what God has in store for them because they can't, they can't get past being blinded by blame. They're too busy looking for who to blame on why they ended up the way that they did that they're not receiving their healing. They're too busy trying to figure out who to blame so they're not receiving their breakthrough. They're too busy trying to figure out who to blame that God is literally saying, I've got something else right here for you. It's like I told y'all last week that many times we settle for less than what God had for us because we're too busy trying to get what we want and God might be saying, I have something more for you. I created you for more and not to say for that thing. But yet we can't get it through our thick heads and we can't get it through our thick skulls. And we sit there and wonder why. Have you ever had anybody try to blame you for everything? Please don't look to the side or to the left because you might be sitting next to that. Don't bump them in the elbow. I don't want anybody fighting. We're a church. We're supposed to be at peace. Just look straight ahead and we're going to get through this thing in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And so these disciples asked Jesus, who sinned? That this man was born blind. Was it him or was it was it his parents? Now, you probably some of you probably read that. I want you to think about that question. If sin makes you blind physically, then everyone in this room should be blind. And that's the truth. You see where I'm going with this? But there are so some people, believers, who become so self-righteous. That they feel entitled to be able to ask, ask a stupid question like this. Now, as an instructor and as a teacher, I always tell my students there's no such thing as a stupid question. But if ever there was a such thing as a stupid question, this one right here would be a stupid question. What would possess the disciples to ask a question like that? Because the truth of the matter is, is that whoever asked that question should have been born blind to. If we're going to blame it on sin. If sin makes you blind, then every one of us in here should be born blind. Because we weren't always saved. 
for those of us who are saved. Let me say it like this. If you're saved now, don't forget how it was before you got saved. And as you remember how it was before you got saved, extend the same mercy and grace that was extended to you instead of an eye of judgment. Amen? You ain't gonna you ain't gonna get anybody to heaven by telling them how they can go to hell every day. You gotta show them the way to heaven. They already know the way to hell. That's where they're going, and that's where they're headed, and that's the way that they're living. You gotta show them that heaven is way better than any other choice that they'll ever make, and you do it by your example, not by your judgment. You're not the judge. God is the judge. Our job, according to scripture, is to pray for one another and to present the word. How? By the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. You want to know how to share Jesus with people? Show them by the way that you live your life. My mom told me many years ago, your biggest, your biggest, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Whenever you minister to somebody. Right, right. But your biggest witness is what she said. Your biggest witness is your walk. That's a good title for a message. I'm gonna have to put that. I'm gonna have to put that in my pocket. Your biggest, your biggest witness is your walk. See, because I can tell you how to live your life, but if I ain't living that way, they ain't gonna take me seriously. As a matter of fact, let me say it like this: You can tell people how they should accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and how they should give their surrender their lives to God, but if you ain't living it, they ain't buying it. Amen. Amen. You gotta live it. You gotta live it. I've been around other people who are like. Hey, I remember before I became a pastor. Hey, George, why can't you be like so and so? He's cool, man. He still goes out. And he still parties with us. He's still, still trying to hook up, right? That's what they would tell me, and I would tell them, "No, God's convicted me of that. I'm done with it." Come on, man, loosen up. You used to be fun. Now you're a Christian, right? That's what they say. And then let me tell you something, then their life goes to hell in a handbasket and all hell is breaking loose in their life. And they come back and they're like, pray with me, please. Please ask God to help me, ask God to deliver me. And of course, me being an immature Christian at the time, I was like, well, go ask that dude that y'all go party with and I'll do all that stuff, go ask him. And they were like, no, bro, he's doing stuff that he's not supposed to with us. Right? Your biggest walk will always, your biggest witness will always be your walk. Sometimes you don't have to say a word all you got to do is walk that thing out. Amen? Amen. That's all you got to do. And then they'll, God will bring them. God will come. As a matter of fact, let me say it like this. From personal experience, I will tell you that whenever I dig into God's word, whenever I dig into prayer, whenever I focus on my relationship with God, God brings the people who need to hear something that I'm studying or that God is dealing with me in. And I think that that's awesome. And this has happened over, over 20 years easily. And now I've, I've finally been able to see it. I've finally been able to discern it. I've finally been able to understand it. But many times people will say that they're a certain way because of what somebody else did to them. And if you are the way that you are because of what life did to you or because of what somebody did to you, then you're never going to be able to fix your life. Because the only one who can fix your life is whoever you're blaming. You've given them that much power and control over your life. That's way too much power and that's way too much control to give to anybody. There's probably somebody in your life right now who's always trying to blame you for everything. It could be a parent, it could be a sibling. Even the things that are beyond your control, somehow or another, they'll try to blame you. And then you feel guilty for being whenever you're happy. Or you feel like you don't deserve anything in life. And this morning, I came to tell you the devil is a liar. Don't you let him lie to you again. Don't you let him win in your life anymore. You're a child of God. There are many people who have said some things to me that I'm like, no. No, the Bible says that you're the child of the Most High God. That you're a child of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Don't let the devil win in your life anymore. There are many people, amen, amen. been people who come to me and they'll say things like I don't have a right to what God has for me you know the Bible says that you're a royal priesthood, a holy nation you see when you give yourself, your life to Christ whether you deserved it or not but because of his grace and his mercy because you're God's kid there are certain blessings and promises that come with it and you don't have to sit there and wish somebody else's sickness on yourself 
You have the power and the authority by the blood of Jesus to bind and rebuke those devils and demons and get them out of there. You don't have to say, come on me instead of my kid. No, you're not going to touch my kid and you're not going to touch me in the name of Jesus. Get out of my house. Amen. Amen. Some of you feel a constant guilt and a constant shame and a constant doubt and a constant fear. And if you read your Bible, what you find out, what you'll find out is that those things are not from God. They're from the devil. The Bible says that there is no guilt or condemnation for they that are in Christ Jesus. It's the devil just trying to torment you. So for whenever you ask, is this God or is this the devil? Where if you're being tormented and if there's guilt and condemnation in your life, obviously that's not from God. Now, there could be conviction over some sin that's in your life. And convic conviction will lead you to repentance. It'll cause you to turn a 180 and run for the cross as opposed to running away and trying to hide from God. That's the difference between guilt and condemnation and conviction. Conviction will always bring you back to the Lord. But I want you to notice something that's very profound here that a lot of people miss. The blind man's there in the room. The disciples are asking Jesus about him. And the blind man didn't even say anything to the men who were questioning Jesus about him. It was Jesus who answered for the man. And today, Jesus will answer for you too. Jesus said, neither sin." It was done so that the works of God could be displayed in him. God allowed this man to be born blind so that he could glorify himself later on at an appointed time. And perhaps today is your appointed time too. Perhaps God brought you in here to listen to this message or you're watching on, on, on online somehow so that way you could get it in your head that perhaps what you've been going through was so that way God could show off his awesome power, his awesome glory, and his awesome might in your life. The Bible says that God's strength is made perfect in your weakness. You see, if you were too strong, you would think in your mind that you didn't need God. But God allows some, some things, I, I preached about this a couple of weeks ago, to, to humble you. So that way you could call out to him and you could cry out to him. But when all hell is breaking loose in your life and your back is up against the wall, God, that's when God shows up and he shows up and he shows up every day in hell in your life. God will show you that he's been with you your entire life. God will show you if you pray and ask the Lord, show me where, where, where it was. He will show you every place that he's been in your life and how he's never left you nor forsaken you, even when you were outside of his presence. And that's why I said it's going to blow a bunch of people's doctrine. Because the Bible says that while you were yet sinners, not after you got saved, but while you were yet sinners, God demonstrated his love for you in this. Jesus got up on a cross and he died for you. While you were yet sinners, Jesus showed his love for you by coming on a cross and displaying, I did this for you so that you could live for me. What I've learned about Christians is that many times we'll give our lives to Christ and we'll surrender here at the altar and we'll cry and then we'll go back out and we'll fall and then we'll think, oh, you see, I can't do this walk. And then they go back to their old life. I messed up. God doesn't need your perfection to show off his glory, church. He doesn't need you to be perfect. All he needs you to do is to keep getting up, repent, ask for forgiveness, and get back in this walk. That's what you do. There's no quitting when it comes to God. Has God ever quit on you? Then you can't quit on him until you take your last breath. You belong to Jesus. You know, when God first called me to preach, I was like, Lord, you need to, you need to find somebody else. You need to find somebody better. And that's why I ran for seven years. Because you know what? You know what I've done. And these people know what I've done. How could I get up there and represent you? You see, I didn't understand that God could get glory out of a sinner like me. But you know what I've learned about walking with God is that he loves to use sinners. You know why? Because it's not about you. It's about what he did in your life. It's about what he wants to do through you to change other people's lives. Oh, what an awesome privilege and what an awesome opportunity to be used by God like that. It wasn't until I started being used and people would come to the altar and they'd be crying and I'd think, this is why you allowed me to go through it. Because you're using me as a lifesaver to go and throw out and bring this person in. Use me, Lord. Then if that's the case, then use me, Lord. Use me, Lord. You see, many people say, 
Hey, why do you preach the way that you do? You want to know why? Because eternity is at stake. And there are people who are on their way to hell and they need to hear this message. And I'm not going to get up here and hoop and holler and you're not going to tell you to wake up and snap out of it and get to the altar and repent and come to Jesus. Then that's what we're going to do. Now I want you to get this, please, before you leave. It says this. That God planned, planned, ordained, and decreed this man's blindness for his glory. Now I want you to apply that to your life this morning. Maybe some of you are single right now so that God could be glorified in your life. Maybe you're married so that God could display his work in your matrimony. Listen to what I'm telling you. Because this is also experience talking up here. The things and the, and the journey that my wife and I have gone through, I'm realizing now that God allowed certain things in our matrimony to grow us up so that he could display his work in our matrimony. And there's a point in your walk with Christ where you think, man, if this is what it took, That is absurd to people who do not believe. Maybe you're divorced so that God could show off his awesome glory, his awesome power, and his awesome might because he has something so awesome or someone so awesome in store for you. Maybe you're sick because God decided that he was going to heal you through your sickness and glorify himself. This man's blindness, it was a setup according to scripture so that God could show off his glory, his power, and his mind in his life. And I believe that God sent me here this morning to give some of you your vision back. To give some of you your focus back. Because you've kind of gotten off tangent and you're, so, you're focused more on your situation. You're focused more on your condition. You're focused more on your sickness. You're focused more on your, on your circumstance than you are on God. And God sent me here to tell you that he's just starting off in your life. You're just, he's just warming up in your life. And Jesus was basically telling these people, hey, 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 don't blame them. Don't blame don't blame him and don't blame his parents. If you're going to blame anybody, blame me. Because he was born this way, so that way today I could show off God's glory and his power and his might in his life. Because Jesus was about to use this man for God's glory. God is about to use your brokenness to glorify himself. God is about to use that place in your heart that's empty so that he can get the most glory out of it. God is about to use your struggle, the thing that you're struggling with, to show you, show you how powerful he is in your life. God has an appointment with you this morning in this church. Or if you're watching online, wherever you're at, God has an appointment with you. God is going to heal you so that we're in the places where he can get the most glory. God is going to meet you in a place where he can glorify himself in your life. Man, I don't know who this is for, but I know it's for somebody because I can feel the anointing of the Holy Spirit all over this message. I can feel the spirit of the living God. I can feel the glory of God in this place. And he sent you here this morning, the miracle maker, the, the way maker, the miracle worker, the promise keeper, the, the light giver in the darkness. And you can sit there and say, you know what? Nobody knows what I've been through. And you're right. Nobody knows what you've been through or what you've gone through and what you had to do to get to where you're at with God now. But you're here now. And the Bible says, forgetting those things in the past and pressing on, pressing forward to the prize that God has for you. You see, that's why you should praise God even when you can't see the whole picture. That's why you should praise him even when you don't have any money. That's why you should praise him in the middle of your storm, in the middle of your problems. That's why you should praise him even though you still have storms, even though you still have struggles. That's why you should praise him even though you haven't gotten your test results back yet. Because when the praises go up, blessings come down. Amen. Amen. When you praise God, you don't have time to blame anybody else. Because you're focusing your attention. It's on the Lord. You know, when this man got his sight back, people didn't even believe he was the same man. Did you know that? If you continue reading that chapter or the next chapter, they're like, they even go to his parents and they're like, hey, is this him or not? Tell us the truth. Imagine that. When God delivers you, he'll do it so good. People won't believe your testimony. I could tell you some stories and y'all wouldn't believe me. So what's the point of me telling you, right? 
But if you want, get with Nacho after church and he'll tell you some stuff. And, and, and then you come to me to make sure it's true. <laughs> there are some people that, that I've done some very dumb stuff with. But when I tell my testimony, people will be like, you're lying. There's no way. And I'll tell them, oh, no, it's, it's true. But I love that about God. He'll change it to where you don't even smell like smoke anymore, whatever it is that you've been through. When, when, these, when they questioned the man, the blind man, I loved his response. He said, look, I don't know. I'm paraphrasing. He says, I don't know. All I know is that I was blind and now I see. Hallelujah. That's all I know is what he said. Jesus, now here's, here's where we blow out people's doctrine. Jesus healed this man that wasn't even saved yet. Jesus healed a man that didn't even know who Jesus was. How do I know? Because later on, Jesus goes to the man and tells him, hey, who healed you? Was it the Messiah? Was it the Christ? And the guy says, look, I don't know. I don't know. He didn't even know Jesus yet. And Jesus healed him, and then he saved him. You know, I find it very interesting because there are certain practices and certain rituals that we do in churches. Now, there are certain things that we'll tell you. But when I read the scriptures, sometimes I'm like, where do we get that from? Like, for instance, the guy on the cross with Jesus, the two thieves. One of them was mocking and the other one says, hey, hey, that's enough. This dude didn't do anything wrong. You and I were guilty of what we did. But he didn't do anything. They crucified him and he's innocent. And then he turns to Jesus and he says, hey, Jesus, remember me in your kingdom. He didn't say, Lord, please forgive me. I want to ask you to be the Lord and Savior of my life. He just said, think of me when you're in your kingdom. And Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. You know, these two men right here, the guy on the cross with Jesus and this blind guy that was born blind, you know what they've taught me is that God loves you so much. He can't wait for you to ask he can't wait to deliver you. He can't wait for that appointed time. And so my question to you this morning is how many of us have missed that appointed time with God? How many of us have missed the miracle? How many of us have missed the blessing because of our stupidity? Can I say it like that? Because of our pride and because of our attitude and because of our mood. How many of us have missed the blessings and the miracles and the promises and the breakthroughs of God because we, we messed it up? start to realize when you look at your life that he's the God that protected you your whole life. He's the God who protected you in the car wreck. He's the God that protected you during that drive-by. He's the God that did it, that kept you from being killed. He's the God that stopped that sickness from killing you and you got better even twice, Brother Marcus. Even twice. He's the God who showed you mercy and grace and compassion while you were drunk and you were high and you were acting stupid and crazy. He's the God that kept you anyway. He's the God that stood by you even when no one else would. He's the God that stood by you even when your spouse walked out with you. He's the God that stood by you when everybody else in this life walked away. He's the one who stayed. He's the God who stays. And he's the God that's still protecting you now. So my thing to you, church, is don't just have an experience with him. Have a real, genuine, authentic relationship with him. Because he's the one who still stands by you today. Get to know a God that didn't let the overdose kill you. Get to know a God that didn't let the bullets kill you. Get to know a God that didn't let the crash kill you. Get to know a God that didn't let you lose your mind. Even when you lost everything else. Get to know a God who wants to heal you and save you. And he can't wait to deliver you and set you free. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, I know this message is for somebody, and I don't know who it is, but whoever you are, you've got to respond to this, because if you don't have people, and you don't respond to a message like this, you can't blame anybody else but yourself, you have no one else to blame, you've got to stay on the course, some of you weren't even supposed to be here this morning, you weren't going to come, but God wants you to know him and who he is now. And just because you tell people that you've always been blessed, it doesn't mean that you know God. Okay, let me say that. 
Because I got a lot of people who know Christian lingo and they'll be like, oh, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. I'm always blessed. Just because you say that doesn't mean you know God. Oh, but my parents serve God. It doesn't mean you know God. You have to have your own relationship with God. You have to have your own relationship with God. And God wants to show you himself in a deeper way. He wants to show himself to you in a more intimate way. God wants you to know him because he already knows you. How do I know? Because in the book of Jeremiah, it says, before you were born, I knew you. Before you were, before you, excuse me, I knew you, I formed you and I fashioned you. I knit you together and I placed you in your mother's womb. And I call you to be a prophet among the nations. That's what he says in the book of Jeremiah chapter one, verse five. It's not on my notes. I know that that's for somebody, that's Holy Spirit right there. I'm telling you that God has always known you and he created you for something. And now he wants you to know him today. And if you walk out of here without answering to this call that he's given you, it's your fault. Nobody else's. As a matter of fact, as a minister of the gospel in the book of Ezekiel, it says that if I if I call if God puts this message in my heart and I speak it out, I'm clear of your blood. Your blood is on your own hands, is what the Bible says. I believe that this is going to be a deliverance service this morning. Please don't reject God's word this morning. For those of you who've been with us all these years, you've never heard me say that. I'm saying that now. Please don't reject this call on your life this morning. Please. Don't do it. Would everyone please stand to your feet? I feel the anointing of God in this place. Oh my God. I feel the anointing of God in this place. <sighs> Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I'm going to do something. I'm going to open up this altar. And if God is speaking to you, I don't want you to look around. We're going to practice social distancing. I'll get that out of the way. But I want to open up this altar. If God is speaking to you, do not, please, please, please do not reject this call. And I want you to find your way up here. And I want you to do something. I want you to surrender whatever it is that you've been carrying. Whatever it is that God starts to show you even now. Whoever it is that God starts to show you. To lay blame on I want you to surrender that person here at this altar to God. That's it. And God's going to do the rest. I'll play some music so that you can have your privacy before God. If you want to do like the other blind men in the Bible, you want to call out and cry out to God, that's okay too. That's okay too. If you are going to stay at your pew, which you can, you can make an altar at your pew if you want. I'm going to ask you to call out to God. Some of you are saying, man, I don't know my purpose. I don't know, I don't know what God created me for. And I'm going to ask you to pray. I want you to ask God, what did you create me for? Will you please start directing me in that direction? Lord, I want to do what you created me for. I don't want to do what I, what I want to do anymore. I want to do what you want me to do. God called me to be a minister at the age of 19, and I ran from it for seven years. I ran from it. And then God called me. Kept, he kept calling me. He brought me full circle. Don't waste seven more years of your life. Don't waste, waste another moment of your life. Do what God called you to do. Do what he created you to do. Don't let anything or anyone hold you back. Don't give anybody that much power in your life. Not even the devil. You belong to Jesus, my friend. And it's time that you start walking in the blessing and the authority and the dominion that he's given you. See, that's what being a Christian is all about. Yeah, you're humble. But the Bible says that you and I can go boldly before the throne of grace. I'm going to play this song, and I'm going to ask you and invite you to surrender, surrender everything to the Lord Jesus this morning. This altar is now open. Every head bowed and every eye closed, please. The Holy Spirit is still doing stuff at the altar. And it's a private moment between God and one of his children. And we're going to let him have his way with him.
fall into this place.
You know, I love, I love, let me tell you something, I love, we're about to be dismissed, but I love when, when, when souls give their lives back to Christ. The Bible says that there's a party going on in heaven. We have an old saying around here that there ain't no party like a Holy Ghost party because a Holy Ghost party never stops. Amen? Amen. I also feel like this, that I got to get the devil back today for all the stuff he's done to us. You know what I mean? Amen. And so did you. Amen. I pray that you were blessed by today's word and that you would, when it comes out on YouTube, we didn't Facebook Live it today, but when it comes out on YouTube later, that you would share it with everyone. Help us to get the word of God out there. Invite your friends and your family. Next week I've got another, these, this last week's word and then this week's word and next week's word, they all kind of come together somehow. I don't know how to do it. I'm not calling them a series, but they're all connected and they all came to me in three different parts. And so I just kind of want to break them down for you. And so I've got something very special planned and lined up for you next week. Please don't miss out. Invite your friends, invite your family, invite your enemies. If they got COVID, tell them to watch online. No, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Let's pray to be dismissed. Heavenly Father, we come before you right now. And I thank you, Lord, for this powerful message that you've given us. I pray that we would chew on it, chew on it, meditate on it. You're the healer, Lord. And I pray in the name of Jesus that you would heal everyone who's sick, everyone who's infirm. We put our trust in you. I thank you, Father God, for the souls that were bold enough and brave enough to lift their hands and say, that's me that you're talking about. I want Jesus in my life. I want to thank you for the people who said, you know what? I'm responding to this message. I pray that you would meet them right where they're at, Lord, and that you would ignite them on fire for you, that you would send revival into each one of our hearts, that you would be with us as we leave this place, that church would, be, would begin when we walk out those doors. I pray in the name of Jesus. That you wouldn't take us anywhere that your presence would not be. And that you would communicate with each and every one of us. And give us knowledge and wisdom and discernment of who you are in everything that we see and in everything that we encounter. That you would be right there with us. Lord, we love you. Now, may the Lord bless you and may he keep you. May he make his face shine upon you. May he turn his countenance towards you and give you his peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Journey to the Cross Church, I love you.
if you enjoy this uh, message, click below.